AMI has grown. We've won the Inc. 5000 list not once, not twice, but we've won five Inc. 5000 list awards um, in the last three years, meaning out of 28 million companies, we're in the top 5,000 fastest growing companies. So we're really proud about that. And that's what got me to be introduced to certain people. And I didn't get introduced to um, Robert Kiyosaki, but Sharon Lecter, who helped him write this book, I did get introduced to through Brandon. Um, I read this book and it made a lot of sense to me because of the way he looked at business. And he said that um, there's four ways to earn income in this country. You can be an employee, you can be a self-employed employee, a business owner, or an investor. And he said this side of the quadrant, he calls this the cash flow quadrant, exchanges time for money and they pay the highest taxes. And this side uses systems, uses their money to make systems which generates more money and they pay lower taxes. And he said the difference between this person and this person is this person is usually a perfectionist that doesn't want to work for somebody else. They want to control things themselves. They are the technician in the business, so they work themselves to death. <coughs> and they think they own a company, but they don't they own a job. And he said people that fall into this category are typically lawyers, accountants, and doctors. And that's very true. For me and a doctor, I mean, I don't know if you agree with that, but I definitely agree with that. Self-employed employee, huh? I totally agree, and that's why we joined AMI. Yeah. So he said the test you can do is you can go on vacation for three months. If you own a business, you'll be able to come back at the end of three months making more money. If you own a job, you'll be called back in two or three weeks to handle a problem. Um, so that's what our, part of our goal was to do that with our clients. We also did the E-Myth Mastery Program. I did this with uh, Colleen. We went to a conference here in Phoenix. This was back in 2004 or five, that era. And we read these books by Michael Gerber. Uh, have you, either of you ever read them? Mm -hmm. Okay, great books. It's all about putting systems in the business and removing the technician from the business as the business owner and making them more of an executive and less than a technician. So we read everything we could find by him. In the back, it had e Worldwide, so we contacted them and said, what else do you have? And they said, we actually teach the Business Mastery Program for the University of Phoenix. So we came out and went to a conference, and this was way back then. I don't think they still do, because the University of Phoenix has changed hands since then. But we met a lot of the professors, and we found out that e Worldwide also did a correspondence course, not online, because online wasn't happening yet. Um, we had to have our stuff mailed to us. We had to fax in our homework and get on a classroom on the phone every uh, week. And we did that for two years. And every week, my wife and I each had to write up at least one system for our homework. So at the end of two years, we had all the systems written to run these practices. And that's when the medical doctor said, I want to buy this practice. He bought it. We turned right around and opened three practices in less than a year in Tennessee. And we've never lived in the state of Tennessee, even to this day. And they were all successful. So... What Gerber says is there's a difference between the leader, which is usually the owner, and the manager. And most people don't understand this cycle. He said a leader has to know what to do and how to do it, but that they don't have to do it. In fact, they shouldn't do it. The leader should be trying to replace themselves, but not by abandoning it, but knowing what and how, and then teaching, influencing others to achieve uh, the same results and creating a culture to have them do that. So. How do you do that? How do you create a culture so that when people go to work, they go, boy, I really want to help Dr. J reach his goals because he's going to help me reach my goals. How do you do that? That's the magic in business. And the companies that did it, Amazon, Google, uh, you know, Microsoft, people go to work there and they're enthused to go to work there. Like we have a friend that works for Amazon. She is the vice president of inventory and vice president of security. She answers straight to Jeff Bezos. Well, she used to answer to Jeff Bezos until Monday. But um, she says they, they have a beer cart come around at 4.30 every afternoon. And I'm like, why do they have a beer cart come around at 4.30? And she says, because everybody wants to leave at 5. But if you have a beer at 4.30, you're going to stay till 7. <laughs> Unless you have a dog, then you've got to go let out, which is why you're allowed to bring your dog to work, too. And I'm like, that's creating culture. That's like people sit around. What do they talk about when they're drinking a beer at work with their work buddies? They talk about work. Mm -hmm. So here they are creating, at the end of their day, for opportunities in the business. So that's creating the culture and um, the leader also has to determine of where we're going. The future is where the leader's head should be. The manager should be in the today, like running it, doing the stuff that the leader is creating and they're putting it in place. 
and getting people into the systems and systems run the business, people run the systems, and the managers direct the people. That's how, that's how a business cycle works. Does that make sense? The system, a cycle of a system innovation for a business, any business, I don't care if it's a chiropractic office, a physical therapy office, or uh, an auto manufacturer, you have innovation occur, creating an idea. That's created by the leader. Then it is implemented, and that is done by the manager, who then also has systems to quantify what they did so that the leader can understand if they did it right or not, and then fix it. And what you'll find is when businesses run this and corporate America runs on this, um, the leader's job is to make a decision. And there's only three possibilities when you go to make a decision. Do you know what they are? There's a right decision, there's a wrong decision, wrong decision and then there's a no decision. no decision. Which is the most costly one to make? No decision. No decision. Because people that are in corporate America understand that making a wrong decision is part of business and what you do is by quantifying it you can fix it. The people who don't make a decision are paralyzed and they don't grow. In fact they implode. Um, but that is the secret what everybody needs to do to, to, to their business to make it scale. How do you do that? There's a lot of stuff that goes on in between here and in between here and in between here. And if you knew that you'd be able to scale your business, right? So let me take it first on a little further. So when I was an undergrad and I was studying marketing, I had to study this guy, Rod Everett Rogers. And he wrote this book called The Diffusion of Innovations back in 1962, the year after I was born. And I had to study it in 1983. And he did research about psychographics in marketing all the way back to the 1890s. And so I didn't even know they were keeping records like that. But he, he looked at it, and he was trying to figure out how do you get a new service or a new product accepted by the public? Somebody comes out with a, a widget. How do you get the whole country to go, I want that widget? That was what this book was about. So what he did was he said he found out there's five types of people in the acceptance chain. And so the, there's the innovators, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. And he explained them like this. The innovators would be the people go like this. Look at this thing I got, guys. Look at this. Isn't this cool? And you go, what is it? I don't know, but it's really cool. It's new. I got it. That's an innovator. They don't have a lot of credibility. They just got to have it. But what happens is once these people get this, it'll get the attention of these people. These people are visionaries, and they go, do you know what this actually can do? You know, like there's a laser. You can point stuff out, and you can change the screen. I mean, do you know how valuable this is? These are the people that figure that out. And once they accept it, then these people go, well, that makes sense to me. I need one of those. And once they do it, these guys who are very conservative go, well, if it works for them, it works for us. And all of a sudden, you got 85% of the population using this widget, and, or 84, and the, the laggards come along and go, you mean you don't have pointer sticks anymore? I got to buy one of these things? All right, I'll take one. That's how it goes. So he figured this out in 1962. And he said that there's five things that have to influence this process. He said, relative advantage, is this easier? You know, I could point out stuff on that whiteboard over there than using a stick or my finger. Is it compatible with what they used to do? Is it more complex? And if it is, is it too complex? Uh, the triability, can you get people to use it to see how it works? And then this one, the observability. It, will there be peer pressure involved in people going, I want to get that too? So we qualify in chiropractic in all these, except for this one. We're relative advantage. What would you rather have? Um, two months or three months of chiropractic or a back surgery that could paralyze you for the rest of your life? One costs $75,000 to $100,000 and has a 75% failure rate. The other one's going to cost you about $5,000 and has a 95% success rate. You know, so you look at that and you go, well, that's definitely an advantage. Compatibility. Well, it's actually better after the chiropractic because there's no scar tissue from the surgery, which is why there's such a high failure rate. So the ours is even better. Complexity. It's more complex to cut into somebody's spine and put bolts in their pedicles and all that stuff than it is to actually do what we do, which has been going on for thousands of years. Trial ability. Yep, we have 10% of the population go to a chiropractor. 
They've all gotten it. They've all had lots of success with it. You don't have too many people running around. There's always some, but you don't have too many saying chiropractic didn't work. Um, but you have plenty of people walking around saying, I had a failed back surgery. But the observability, the peer pressure, are others doing it? Well, a certain number of people have to do it for this one to take effect. And that number falls on this graph. So he drew it as a graph and he said, the innovators are 2.5%, the early adopters are 13.5%, the early majority is 34, the late majority is 34, and the laggers are 16%. And the significant part of this graph is right here. It's 15%, which is the tipping point. I'm sure you've heard of that, right? You get 15% of the population to agree to anything, and the rest just start going. Once these people say, yes, this is good, these people go, I want it. I want it, I guess that's all I got. See how that works? So where's chiropractic? Right here, 10%. And I can tell you from having family members who are vice presidents of pharmaceutical companies, it is not an accident that we have been stuck at 10% for over 100 years. And that's the reason why, because of pharmaceuticals? Pharmaceuticals, look, we sued them in the will case, right? right. Were you in practice back then? I was just, I've been in practice 30 years. Yeah, so have I, same. So when I was in, you were in school and I was in school. As a matter of fact, I started school the month the Wilk case settled and the AMA was found guilty. But what I didn't know, Sid Williams, I went to life, Sid Williams, you know who that was? Mm -hmm. He was the, the president of the school, very, very strong, straight chiropractic, very outspoken Southern. And he comes out and says, y'all think you won this lawsuit? You didn't win, crap. He brought the entire school together for a special mm -hmm. meeting and it was like, I don't know, a couple, 3,000, 4,000 people. You didn't win crap. They already have plan B and act, and you're, they're going to give you insurance and take it away and watch you all go out of business. And I'm like, how did he know that? Well, here's what I didn't know that he did know. Right before the Will case settled, when the AMA realized they were going to lose, the AMA is who? Pharmaceutical. Yeah, not medical doctors. Less than 8% of medical doctors belong to the AMA. Did you know that? No. Yeah, they're, they're funded by the pharmaceuticals. So my nephew's a medical doctor, and he, when he went to medical school, the AMA was after him to join, and they were giving him gift cards to Banana Republic and for clothing and Cheesecake Factory for food and throwing him parties. And I said, does anybody join? They go, no, none of us joined because all of our professors who are medical doctors are saying, don't join the AMA. That's the drug companies. They are funded by the American Pharmaceutical Advertising Council. So what did the AMA do when they knew they were going to lose that lawsuit? They bought all of the billing codes in healthcare. And they became the experts to tell the insurance companies who gets paid what. And chiropractors need to be limited because they rip off the system. You're going to be paying them $5,000 a case. And they'd say to the insurance, and you know if it's $5,000 and under the new laws, they're only allowed to charge up to 15% of the cost of health care. Do you want to cover a $5,000 thing that has a 90% success rate or a $75,000 thing that has a 75% failure rate? And they'll go, we'll take that one all day long because 15% of $75,000 is a lot better than 15% of $5,000. We don't want health care to be in the millions. We want it to be in the trillions. And it is. Affordable Care Act came in 10 years ago. We were at $2.3 trillion. Now we're at $3.3 trillion. It went up by 30%. The Affordable Care Act drove the cost of health care through the roof. What a scam. So who's the highest paid, um, highest paid executives right now? Hospitals, then pharmaceuticals, then insurance. What's the highest paid profession? Surgeons, right now in this country. So there's not, they're not trying to save money. They're trying to redistribute the money, and they're very good at it. They do it through that thing I just explained to you. So they're holding us back from being accepted. That's why every once in a while there'll be an article when they talk about it. They don't say doctor. They say in chiropractor. Like if I was, if I saved people today, if I walked out and there was a shooting and I saved people, I'd be on the news as chiropractor Mike Carberry, not Dr. Mike Carberry. I'd be on the news as chiropractor Mike Carberry. Why? Because who's the biggest advertiser on, the, on TV? Pharmaceuticals. They're the biggest advertiser in every medium. So they keep us with an image as ripping people off. And you know what they tell us we do to rip people off? Maintenance care. And then people come in and they go, yep, you just got to keep coming. And they go, oh, damn, I knew it. These guys are ripping me off. Even though it's a fraction of the price, the cost for our whole program is less than the anesthesiologist to put them to sleep for the surgery, right? And we're not giving them anything that's going to turn them into a drug addict. They look at us as ripping people off. So how do we overcome that? We have this barrier in here that, that Rogers didn't anticipate. 
we have to somehow force ourselves from here to here. We have to have the public going, I want this. If they want it, I want it. Well, I guess I got to get that. That's what we want. To get that, we have to get the doctors to go, I want this. So how do we do that? You make the doctors successful at doing this model. Right now, really good doctors are going, oh, if I want to make a lot of money, I'm a surgeon. But we work with Arizona Pain Relief, the largest pain management company in the state of Arizona, and they don't use opioids. Our goal is to drive this past here, because if you're successful, you're going to attract medical doctors. AMI started this program with Cardinal Ventures a little over a year ago. So we have guys that are in this program for about a year. And some of them are doing so well that we just got a phone call recently from a, a group of 150 family practices in New York and New Jersey. And they said, we're done with family practice. How do we do what you're doing? So we're, probably gonna, we're trying to work out something with them. But if we get groups like that doing this, and all of a sudden they're going to their colleagues, this is the best thing ever, right? Then all of a sudden the colleagues are going to be going, maybe I should be looking at that type of practice. I don't have to do surgery. I don't have to put on them opioids. I can actually help people. I get to know the patient. This is a good thing. That's what our drive is. So to do that, we want to disrupt the healthcare industry by going over that tipping point. And that's what it's called, disrupting the industry. When you go into an established industry, sometimes Rogers did acknowledge there's going to be powers there that have the money that are going to try to prevent people from coming in. So what we're trying to do is go in and disrupt the industry by getting results where people aren't getting results now. So we are the early adopters. Only pe people will follow us only if we are successful. So what our goal is, it's kind of funny. I, n I was never in it for the money. I remember saying to my wife, she's like, you got to do better notes. I'm like, I don't work for an insurance company. I work for my patients. And she said, so who's going to work for the patients when you're out of business? Because they took all the money back. This was pretty early in my career. I was like, crap, I guess I do got to pay attention to that. So we met Grant Cardone. Because of our success, uh, Grant Cardone, there he is on the cover of Success Magazine. Um, he is the guy who's one of the three stars of Undercover Billionaire this year. Have you seen that show? It was, last year was the first year, and it was, what they do is they take, last year it was a billionaire. They gave him $100 and an old beat-up car and said, this is all you get. You have to change your name, change your identity. You can't use any of your contacts. You have 90 days to make a million dollars. Then he did it. I want to see this show. This well, this great. is What's year, this, uh, Discovery Channel. Okay. So this is year two, and they have three people doing it, and he's one of them. And it's the same thing. $100, they shaved his head, he had to change his identity, and he told us it was the hardest thing he's ever done. And he wouldn't tell us, because the series is still going, if he did it or not, but I have a feeling he did it. Um, so Grant comes and speaks at our convention two years ago, <coughs> and he brings with him this guy, Brandon Dawson. So I thought Brandon was a security, and backstage, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm walking them all through, and I go, so are you his security? He goes, no, I think I'm going to be his business partner. I'm like, oh, sorry. So Brandon started Audigy, and I'm not going to tell you a story. He's got a story to tell, but I can tell you, when he was 29 years old, he became the youngest person in history to ring the stock market bell for taking his first company public at 29 years old. And he graduated high school with a 2.5 average and never went to college. And what happened, he'll tell you the story, I don't want to tell the story, but he actually had Wall Street investors put in millions of dollars and then they stole his company and he was dumped out on the street. So he turned right around and did it again without the investors and blew their doors off. And that was the audiology, the hearing aid clinic, or the audiologist. He raised the bar from the average audiologist making about $200,000 $200, annual collections gross revenue was the average. His clients were doing one to 1.5 million average. He had guys doing 18 million. Um, Quentin and I were on the phone with a, a potential client. He's now a client. And we were explaining to him about the basic core AMI program, which is our purpose is, and I don't know if you ever heard our mission statement, but our mission statement is this. AMI is a company that disagrees with the status quo of healthcare because we believe that the power of healing lies within the individual. If you look at that, you go, Okay, so then everything we do is to stimulate that individual to heal himself. Yes, that is not done in traditional healthcare. That's why we disagree with the status quo of healthcare. Our purpose is the best friggin' tool the doctor has is the patient's body. The patient's best tool is their own body. They just don't know how to use it to get it to heal itself. So what we're doing is everything we do in these clinics is focused on getting that potential to help the patient get better. 
when you look at that, you go, wow, if you could actually pull that off, that would disrupt the industry. And it should be, even though the, the money would shift, the cost of healthcare would come tremendously down and it would shift dollars to the clinics and not to the pharmaceutical companies and not to the hospitals and not to the insurance companies. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. We're not fighting one foe, we're fighting three. Those three, the big three. Um, so he's done it in audiology. And what he did was he did so well that when he sold his company, do you, you guys know what EBITDA is? All right, I'm gonna explain that in a little bit, but it's how you value a business. He sold his company for 77 times EBITDA. EBITDA is roughly the profit you can pull out of a business in a year. So 77 years worth of profit is what he sold his company for. And then they said, but part of it is you gotta stay on as a consultant for a couple years. So the year he sold it to that company using his program, that company increased their revenue by 1.4 billion the first year. So the guy's a genius. He's a friggin' genius. You'll see when he comes in. So together, Grant Cardone, he by himself owns Cardone Equity, Cardone University, and Cardone Capital. He's in real estate, he's in sales and sales training. He's a best-selling author. A lot of his books are back there. But he started Cardone Ventures with this guy, and they're 50-50 owners. Because Cardone Ventures is helping small businesses grow big without the wolves of Wall Street. And since he's done it in audiology, and he also did it in dentistry, he's now doing it with us. And he said, the funny thing about our clinics, we have 11 times the potential of the other two industries. Because what we do, because it's so, I mean, it's the number one health complaint people have. It is. Yeah. So the potential is phenomenal. So let me give you an idea how these guys think. So here was, this was a year ago in November signing the agreement in Grant Cardone's office in Miami. There's Brandon, we all signed it. That's the partners, you know Bobby, right? So we're now partners with Grant Cardone um, and Brandon Dawson. We were their first client. And what they did was they created this program with us on how to, what he did with the audiologist, it's the same thing. But I was telling you a story about uh, Quentin and I were on the phone with this guy. And he says, all right, so I'm interested in my core program. I'm doing about 500 a week, I'm, I'm taking home less than 200? I'm like, that's terrible. You're doing 500 visits a week, which is a stellar practice, and you're taking home less than 200,000 a year. And uh, we said, what we do, and like, we explained the whole thing to him. He goes, yeah, 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 what's after that, though? After the two years, because it's a two-year program, as you know. He goes, what's after that? And I said, well, do you know who Grant Cardone is? Nope. Do you know who Brandon Dawson is? Brandon Dawson, the hearing aid guy? You know him? My brother's an audiologist. My brother was one of his clients. My brother is five years younger than me. My brother retired five years ago, a multimillionaire. He's in with you? I said, yep. He says to Quentin, send me a contract. He's now a client. It was like, just like that. If you're doing it with him, I'm in with you because he knows what this guy can do. This is GrowthCon. Do you know what GrowthCon is? Grant Cardone has a convention every year of entrepreneurs. Um, last year was this one. That was my biggest audience, 13,000 people. That's um, Brandon and I on stage talking to all these entrepreneurs about what we're doing in healthcare. Um, which is really cool to get up in front of 13,000 people. Um, to give you an idea how they think, I just want you to picture this. Now, you're not the business owner, but you're pretty high up in this very large group, and then you are the business owner. So do you have goals for this year? I do. Does your company have goals for this year? When you made goals for this year, how did you make the goal? How did you know what, what the number would be? Um, I've got, I don't know, my wife called, says I have these, these glasses that I'm not, they're just huge goals, so that's, I just, okay. I, I, I just came up with what I'm doing, and I should be, you know, doubling or tripling that. So it's a reflection based on the previous year's achievement. Most people who make their goals go, if I did a million last year, then I should do like at least 15% better than that this year. If I did double that, that'd be fantastic, right? But that's making your assessment based on looking in the rearview mirror. And a leader should be looking in the past or the future? Future. Future. Reflection point two could be, well, what did all my competition do? Am I the biggest one in the game? And if not, what did they do? And could I beat them? That's a little bit more of an audacious goal. But reflection point three is how Brandon Dawson looks at it. And he says, what was your market penetration? What was the potential? in your market. All the zip codes that you treat, all the zip codes you average to, all the clinics you guys have all over the place. 
What's the potential in those zip codes? And then what was your market penetration? That's a whole different way to look at it. Because when you look at that, you go, well, that number is way bigger than the other two put together. Is it possible? And that brings me back to what I said to you before Jay came in. Who has more potential? A medical clinic with chiropractic and physical therapy and injections and regenerative medicine or a guy who's going to start a business by putting books in a box and selling them online? Which one has more potential? The first one. Yeah, but Amazon started as the second one. Our biggest limitation is between our ears. What we think we can do is what we do. And the job of the leader is to stretch everybody's imagination so they think bigger. Because what we think we can do is what we'll do. I used to tell my associates, when you walk into a room and you're sitting with a patient, you're going to talk to a patient about a care plan, they're not hearing a word you're saying. What they're hearing is what you're thinking. So you better be thinking good thoughts. You better be thinking, I want to help this person. If you can't think that, you should not work for me. Because every time I go in, the last thing I do is I stop outside, I look at a chart and I go, what's going to happen to this person if I don't get them under care? They're going to die, and they're going to die painful. And then I walk in. That's the only way to do it. We started a year ago. We have 30, 38 practices took the first step. Everyone that finished the first step went on to the second step and the third step. And I'm going to show you how, how that goes. But it's the data, getting the data. That's how all of corporate America works. That's how the, our competition, the drug companies work. They work off of data. The insurance companies work off of data. The hospitals work off of data. So what we're missing is the group and the data. The rule of thumb in business is you don't treat your first patient, you don't make your first widget until your exit strategy is in place. Why? Because there's things you could do in that business that would make your business more valuable or less valuable. So how do they value a business? They do EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Let's say you have a million dollars worth of profit in a year and you have a good accountant and he says, well, we don't want you to pay taxes on a million, so we're going to make it look like 700, so we're going to depreciate some things, we're going to amortize some loans. You know, you got taxes, you got interest, you got to pay on those loans. So we're going to actually show that you have less income with your deductions, so you pay less taxes. But when you go to sell that practice or get a loan for that practice, the bank doesn't want to know what you paid in taxes or what was taxed. They want to know what is the real profit generated by that business every year. So by doing this formula, they come up with a number. And let's say that number comes out to be a million. And then they hit that number with a multiplier. And the multiplier is based on different things in your business. So for example, if you have written systems, that increases your multiplier. If you have systems in place to make sure that people use the systems and measure the systems and quantify the systems, that increases the multiplier. If you have an associate, that increases the multiplier. If you have a second practice, that increases the multiplier. The more practices you have, the bigger the multiplier gets because they go, if this is duplicatable over 15 practices, this must be a really good system. Does that make sense? Have you ever been approached by a company saying, hey, we, we're interested in, we buy up chiropractic practices and we want to put it in a big group and you'll, we'll pay you X amount and you can keep working there. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Here's what they're doing. They're going, okay, so he's got a million dollars worth of practice in his practice. In a chiropractic environment, the multiplier is usually 0.7%. So if you went to sell your practice as a chiropractic office, you would probably get 700000 not even a year's worth of profits. A medical office is somewhere between 1% and 3%, or 1% and 3 times. The more systems they have, the more people they have working for them, the formula for how much income is generated per employee, like most people don't even know this, that banks calculate this, but they'll look at your gross revenue and they'll look at the number of employees you have, and if you have $250,000 per employee being generated, they go, that's a pretty good formula. That's a good balance. They're actually effectively using their employees. That means we can invest in this business. That raises your EBITDA rate. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. So many things you would never even think about that raises your EBITDA rate. So you put all these in place, that's how Brandon got 77 times EBITDA. And the cool thing about it was all his stuff that he created that was proprietary, he created an outside company. So when he sold it, they didn't get that they still pay him for the use of this stuff because he still owns it. And he sold this for 77 times EBITDA. But the company went up by $1.4 billion the first year. So they're very, very happy paying him all that money. Does that make sense? This is how business actually 
explodes. It shouldn't be you're in the trenches working along and pounding away and pounding away and pounding away and pounding away and then sometimes 50 years later all of a sudden you're going, wow, I made a lot of money. It goes like this. You work, you scale, you work, scale, you hit a wall. That first wall is usually like $300,000. Going from zero to 300000 you hit a wall zero and then you get through it and then all of a sudden you hit a wall at 300000 You get through that wall because there's certain things that are holding you back. Then you hit a wall at a million. Then three million. Then five million. Then ten million. Then fifteen million. Then twenty million. Then fifty million. Then a hundred million. And there's different barriers at each wall. And every time you hit it, you don't even know what the barriers are, so you don't know why you can't get over that plateau. This is true for all businesses. There's four pillars of business: operations, marketing, finance, and people. We can break people into two categories: HR and professional development. This is hiring them, keeping them with incentives for their investments, for their pay, for their bonuses, and then professional development is the training and creating that culture. And most of us don't have a clue about any one of those things. Most doctors that I know do not know the reason that you should be able to use your profit and loss up against your balance sheet. They just don't even look at it. They wait for the accountant to tell them at the end of the year. They have no idea why they do what they do with those finances. Most of us don't know how to market. We do transactional marketing. We go, Candace, you're a marketing company, so how much would it cost me for you to get me like 20 new patients a week? How much would that cost? Oh, 10 grand a month? I'll do that. So then I give her the 10 grand. And then I get 20 new patients a week. Oh, she lived up to her word. I get 25. Oh, she's better than I thought. You get 15. Oh, she sucks. That's transactional. That's like, I'll pay you, you give me patience. That is not how corporate America markets. Corporate, Amar corporate America has ads running and they're checking the data constantly. Why is this zip code working better than that zip code? What ads are we running? Same ads, so let's try a different ad. That one works better than that one, then this one works better than this one. What's different? The border is different. The, the color of the text is different. The type of font is different. The message we're saying is different. The people in the commercial are different. These are old people, these are young people, these are white people, these are black people, these are rich people, these are poor people. And they constantly look at it, what resonates, and they increase their market penetration. What we found when we worked with Brandon, he did an analysis of our business for six months. We had 40 or 38 practices do this already. I found that doing $5 million practice in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I was penetrating 0.75 of my market, 0.75. And he said, there, one of your competition is doing like point f or doing 4%. And if I went up to 1.25%, my $5 million practice would be doing $8 million. Just by going from 0.75 to 1.25 penetration. Well, now that I know that, I'm like, well, crap, I need to figure out why my ads aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and why some zip codes are better than others. And then you got, he also looked at, What's the potential in the zip code? And found out the one with the most potential I was getting the least numbers from. It's because my message wasn't resonating. If I could figure that out, well then I could actually hit that market and penetrate. But I'm not going for 1.25. I'm gonna go for like three. Because three puts me in an $18 million practice. And there's no reason I can't have, there's a, a dermatologist down the street from my office, he's doing about $20 million. If he can do it, why can't I do it? My stuff is more important than what he's got. His sale is somebody looking in the mirror going, yeah, I look great. My stuff is you can stand up and look in the mirror. Right? Mm -hmm. So I look at it and I go, why can't I do that? I remember I had a, a, a girl working for me. She was a case manager in Pennsylvania. She was really good, really personable. She would penetrate to people. She would just say, like, what do you mean you can't do this? What are you, crazy? And they'd be like, you really think so? Yeah, I mean, look at you. You need help. And she'd get money out of them. And they would feel better. And at the end, they'd be ha hugging her for helping them get the financing. And she, she got offered a job by a dentist down the street from me in Pennsylvania who was doing cosmetic dentistry, all cash. And he knew that she could collect cash and he paid her, I couldn't afford what he was paying her. And he lured her down there and six months later she came back and said, you know what, there's no purpose in what I'm doing. We're doing veneers. We're doing like stuff like that. And there's no purpose in that. Can I have my job back? I said, I can't pay it, I don't care about the money. I want the job back, I liked working here. So we hired her back. And when she was working with us, she's like, remember that patient, Susie, who came in here who couldn't get the financing to do your care plan? And I was just chiropractic at the time. You know, you were like asking her for $4,000. And 
do you know she dropped 20 grand on veneers right down the street? I was like, you're kidding me. Nope. And then, and then she went out and got a boob job after that. I'm like, you're kidding me. So it's all in here that stops us from growing. And if you can get over that barrier and get the data and know, this is why I'm not penetrating in that market. This is why this isn't coming back to me. All of a sudden, that $3 million practice, now you're over a million, right? Mm -hmm. And once you get our systems in place, the sooner you do it, you're going to start making money. And what typically happens is our average client doubles in the first year. That's usually what happens. Um, wouldn't that be nice? I'm expecting, I'm expecting a lot from me. Yeah. Well, double is conservative. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you something in a minute. Um, this is how you do it. You got to get the data here and here and here and here and here and here. So he said to me, he said, look, the way I did it is I hired an expert in operations. They're not cheap. They have an MBA in healthcare op operations. You're going to have to pay over 100 grand a year for that person. And then I hired somebody in marketing who's an expert in marketing and not like a marketer down the street who can run ads in the landing page, but somebody actually understands a marketing agency. You're going to pay over 100 grand for that person. And then you have to hire an expert in finance and an expert in human resources and an expert in training employees. So when I hired this team, it was 600,000 plus. And that can do 18 practices. So we just hired our second team. And now we're in the process of hiring our third team. And these are our coaches for our advanced program. This is how we're doing it. These are the people to help you collect the data. They show you ways to market. They show you ways, you know, different things you can put in your practice. So you're collecting the data automatically. And that data is being put together, and all these coaches working with the data from all the different practices are able to show best practices to our clients. By doing our program, if you're not a client, we have come up with a hybrid program for large groups like yours where we can fast track you into the program. But the goal for both of you would be to get you into this because once you get the systems in place that AMI uses, now we can collect the data, and it's the data aggregation that makes this all worth everything. Mm -hmm.